to order. Is there any uh, changes or additions, uh, modifications to the agenda as printed? I do want to add a, a storm event item just to talk about that, how it went. Good. Um, I'd like to uh, strike the procedure for the sale of the trailer. Um, okay. I'm still doing a little bit of research on that, and I just haven't had time to finish enough to have a very informative conversation about it. Okay. Anyone else? If we have time, we'd like to discuss the sheriff's budget. Okay. Anyone else? And Nat said he'd be a little late getting yes. here. Yes. He's up there. Yes. <laughs> okay. Rosemary? Or no, wait a minute. First thing we got, is the board prepared to take action on the meeting minutes for October 7th and 14th? I think you already approved the October 7th board, but it's just the 14th. My mistake. Okay, so correction, just October 14th. Is the board prepared to? Well, and what about your last meeting? What about October 21st? Well, this is only on the agenda. I didn't have the October 21st minutes when I was making up the agenda to send out. The, you got those out to us kind of in between we we have them we've had them before this meeting, mm -hmm. but we didn't have them before I wrote the agenda. Okay. Is the board comfortable adding the twenty first as well to approve mm -hmm. or not? Why don't we just take care of the fourteenth, Mr. Chair? Okay. Are you so moving? Yes. We have a motion to approve the October fourteenth meeting minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, those opposed? <coughs> Rosemary, you get the floor. Okay, I only have one item. Um, we got a statement from Ship 7 for the trailer at Katie Wynn Park. And this statement starts February of 2018 and goes up through October one of this year for a total of $4,236.80. The monthly lot rent is $261, and I would recommend that the town would pay $261 for October. It says October is when we took it. Took possession. Uh, ship, sorry, uh, ship 7 sent us a bill for back rent on the trailer in Cape that Rosemary, and I, I concur with Rosemary's recommendation, is to pay the October rent, the lot rent, because that's since we've taken possession of the trailer. Mm -hmm. And this is the same trailer that you were looking at selling? Yes. Uh, so we'll be selling it as soon as possible, but I would <coughs> dispute their uh, claim that we owe the back lot rent on the trailer. Uh, they could, you know, I'm not sure what their options are, but it, it wasn't our trailer until October of this year, so we should pay the lot rent starting October of this year. And will we pay the October lot rent? Would you consider a motion to include uh, paying the October and Continuing until yeah, the trailer we sell. So we don't have to do this every month. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good point. idea. Yeah, we can, whatever payments we've had paid for lot rent, we can add it to the selling price. Okay. Yeah. So Is it always going to be that amount every month? The 260 Well, it looks like it switched. In March, it was 255 then it went up to 261 The I'm looking for a second. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any more discussion? So, when we 
when it's sold, do we sell it for fair market value or are we limited to taxes? I need to do a little bit more research on it. I think that might not be the it might not be the case that we have to sell it for the amount owed by taxes like it was before we take in possession of it. But Rosemary doesn't believe that's the case, and I'm inclined to trust her opinion on this. So I've been inside that trailer, and it has a broken window. Uh, who knows? You know, if the pipes are burst or anything like that, it's going to take some money to fix that place up. Uh, so that might be a moot question. Exactly. Okay. Any more discussion? None. All in favor, signify saying aye. Aye. Those opposed. Anything else? No. no. Anybody got any questions for Rosemary? If not, we'll move on a little bit early, but the broadband committee looks like it's here. <laughs> so we'll give you the floor. Yeah, but you guys selected that because you talking anyway, so I don't even know why you guys are here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so y'all have the survey results. Um, I want to just take two seconds before we get into that to just kind of point out. Um, we formed earlier this year to just some identifying options to provide high speed internet service to all residents of Johnson. Um, we took out the emphasis on fiber optic um, because it's less expensive to run than coaxial cable um, and it's more reliable than wireless models. Um, it's got better bandwidth overall speed and um, yeah, it's just kind of the way that the, it, it's, it's the next thing basically. Um, so, um, does anybody have any questions about fiber, uh, fiber optic as uh, an IS uh, internet service mechanism? Before we get into this. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Um, so, fiber, fiber optic is just, it's, it's just a different way to get the internet to your house. Right. Uh, okay. But it is kind of the, the latest and greatest, and it offers the best speeds, and um, it's, uh, yeah, and it's also cheaper. Um, I think it's coax is something like, was it $16 a mile to run it? And- Oh, keep going, I have some zeros. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, so that was 16 households, right, sorry. Um, it, there was something like 16 households per mile to make coax um, um, affordable, whereas with fiber, it's something like seven. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a much more economical um, <coughs> mechanism to deliver. Um, so the thing we decided was before we started making any recommendations, we would probably want to go ahead and pull the town, see what they were thinking about the things. Um, so we did this through um, Front Porch Forum. We did this on an online survey form. Um, and then of course, because we were asking about internet service, which some people in town might not have, um, I was at the booth on a, a Tuesday Live, the last couple of Tuesday Lives, offering people to take the survey um, if they hadn't had a chance to already. Uh, so what we found is that most people had Comcast or Consolidated. Um, those were kind of the majority. Um, we found that Comcast had decent ratings for both speed and reliability. Um, and cons Consolidated had pretty consistently low scores on both of those fronts. Um, one thing we did not ask was um, customer service, how people, how satisfied people were with the level of, of service you know, that they received when they had a problem. Um, so you know, that's kind of missing from this. Um, but one thing we did uh, notice when we were asking people if they didn't have service was, well, why not? And the big one was that they couldn't afford it. Um, so uh, affordability kind of starts to enter into the picture uh, for people who might need this, but who, who can't afford it. So um, while affordability was important, um, we found that most respondents said that um, reliability and speed was, was more important. So that might be kind of a self-selecting thing of you know the people who have it feel like you know the most important thing is that they have it, but you know the people who don't have it don't have it because they can't afford it. <laughs> so um, as as far as usage, um, email was obviously the most used service. Everybody uses email. Um, one thing that I found really interesting was that streaming video was tied with professional work. So you know, you've got people using Netflix, you think about how popular and ubiquitous Netflix and Hulu and, and you know, HBO and all of these services are. As many respondents were saying that they used it to work from home to do professional work, um, which is, a, that's a big deal when you're thinking about the economic development of your town. 
Um, so, and then, you know, and then on top of that, you have you know, people using it for homework. Um, transferring large files, um, you typically think of that as being, you know, again, work related, um, at least I do. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but you know, you also have, you know, you have streaming, streaming video, social media, um, online gaming. A lot of people use it for communication as well. So, you know, not just email, but things like um, Amish, which is voice over IP, which is using your phone as internet instead of having a landline. Um, or video calls, so like when you're Skyping with you know, your grandkids on the other side of the country. Mm -hmm. so, um, so on the question of the Town of Johnson Fire Committee is exploring opportunities to provide town residents with better internet access, how important are the following factors to you? Um, what we found is that the most important item was privacy, safety, security, and consent. Um, the retrospect, this was a little tricky to parse out as it could probably have different meanings to different people. Um, but we find that with people scoring net neutrality really high, and, you know, coming in second, um, you, you can kind of make a reasonable assumption that people do care about things like the security of their data and you know and, and how the how the internet how the ISPs are using your data, you know, maybe in ways that you might not be comfortable with. <laughs> so it's a little bit hard to say that you know privacy for some people could mean things like I don't want um, I don't want a company to turn over my data to a law enforcement agency without a warrant. Um, whereas other people would interpret privacy or, or the security as I don't want to get a virus, you know, mm -hmm. and this comes with internet antivirus. So we, we can't really draw any conclusions from that, but I think that we added the net neutrality question. I think it does sort of nudge the needle a little bit towards this idea of, of being able to browse privately. Um, so, um, so what this all boils down to is the fiber committee is going to be recommending to the select board that we pursue a fiber district model, um, at least starting with the village of Johnson, but um, with the option to expand out. Um, we identify three potential administrators for such a project. Uh, we don't actually have a recommendation at this time, but we do have the pros and cons laid out. Um, so the first one is MC Fiber. Um, they're basically ready to go. They're already starting in on French Hill. Um, they do have great word of mouth from people who have them. They say that the service is great, the customer service is great. Um, the cons is that they, you know, they're, they can, they're a little fuzzy on the details with, with that NDA situation where um, it can be a little bit hard to, to get a, a clear answer out of them. Um, also, I'd like to point out that um, with this company, with any private company, um, the, the issue of what the contract looks like in terms of if, if there's some, you know, some sort of like five year, 10 year contract for them to be, you know, the, basically the sole provider of the company, obviously people are still gonna have Comcast and everything, but if we create a situation where we effectively create a town-wide monopoly, um, we need to be really careful about handing that over to a private company where after that, the terms of that contract are up, they can jack the prices or you know, cut the service or anything like that. Um, to that end, there's also Kingdom Fiber. Um, we're going to be taking a meeting with them later this month, 12th. Um, so we don't really have a lot of details on them. Um, we do know that they lean heavily on, on a wireless model. So that's not fiber, so that's kind of outside of what we would really recommend. They do have fiber, but they have kind of a, a secondary architecture of having this wireless model. Um, but the wireless model could make it potentially cheaper to administer if they do more wireless, more people do the wireless option. That, that could make it cheaper um, for the town overall. So that's something to bear in mind. Uh, the last option would be to, um, to basically roll our own and do the electric co-op and have the, them be the, um, the people who do the, the district. What that the pro for that is that that's local control, um, and we have we they basically own most of the infrastructure. They own a lot of the poles. So we wouldn't have to worry about getting toll rent prices. Um, there's also the issue of you know they yeah they, they kind of already have a lot of equipment that they could be using for that. So um, cons would be time is the big one. Um, the fiber, uh, the, there are two uh, things that are studying that, which is 
First of all, there's a state law which we, uh, we expect to be overturned in the next legislative session regarding electric um, utilities not being able to also operate as ISPs. Um, everybody I talk to says that that thing is going away <laughs> because it's such a big deal for people to, to you know, the Scots trying to push this, you know, model of uh, EC fibers model um, that's kind of standing in the way. Um, and then the other thing is that their own oh, charter um, says that they're not going to be an ISP, but there is some, like, there's some talk that they might be redoing that in the, in the wake of all of this. So. Um, and then, yeah, yeah, obviously time, you know, it's, it's not going to be as iffy as a private industry. Um, and then one thing that is kind of uh, applies to everybody <laughs> is financial restrictions, which is kind of nobody has the money to just come in and do door-to-door -door service in Johnson, which is one of the things that the Fiber Committee is really, um, we really want to make sure that everybody in Johnson has access to high-speed internet. Um, you know, maybe we don't get fiber to, you know, like, for example, the Katie Wynn, like we don't have fiber to all of all of the residences in Katie Wynn, but we you know could do some kind of fixed network with a mesh network or something like that. Um, but the, the important thing is that we want to make sure that there's no places in Johnson where people don't have access to high-speed broadband internet, especially when you look at the professional work option. Um, this becomes really important for the economic development for the grant list. Um, you know it. You know, raises home values and it, like homes that have high speed internet they, they have a higher value and homes that don't have access to internet have lower home values so that affects the grant list um, so we'd like to look into exploring grants um, and using the revolving loan fund to maybe help what you know whatever option we go with to to get out there and get everybody covered um, charlie has had crunched some numbers and said um, at about 24k per mile, which is sort of the going rate, um, he's thinking it'll be up 1.2 million to wire Johnson up. Um, so you know, it's not a small, small matter, but again, it's it's pretty important. Above other things, um, I'd like to say is that uh, you know, apart from it being crucial to economic development, um, it would make Johnson a more attractive community to people who are looking to you know work from home. Um, it would. Also, you know, this is being done in other communities. Um, you know, you hear about like little rural towns out in Missouri that have fiber. Um, you know, why not us? <laughs> why not? We could be one of those really cool communities where people go and say, oh wow, you have fibers throughout the entire town, that's great. Um, also important is um, that access to reliable, affordable broadband makes it a lot easier for people to age in place. So, you know, if you don't need to worry about, you know, not having the ability to communicate with your um, your healthcare, your home healthcare um, provider, you know, you can do you can do um, FaceTimes and stuff like that with people. Uh, it, yeah, it, it's you're much less likely to have to be displaced as a result of, of aging, um, um, you know, concerns. So um, that's that's the spiel. <laughs> Are there any questions? Mm, that's great. Mm -hmm. Oh, hi. Hi, can I ask a question? Yes. Sure. It, did I hear it was inclusive of the village? No. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we, well, we would do the village. I mean, the, the village is part of the town. I, I think you I think, said you were going to start with the village first. Though. Yeah, that's what you said. You said you are going to start with the village first. Did I? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking. Well, there, there is actually the question of whether or not we would start density and move out, or start in the places that don't currently have um, service and move in. And that is actually something that as a committee we did not decide. So if I said we start with the village, and <laughs> I, I apologize, I misspoke, because we did, we honestly did not come up with a solution on that because that is a big question of how we would want to tackle that. But then you went on to say starting on something on French Hill. Oh, oh, that was <laughs> MC Fiber, sorry. Uh, MC Fiber is currently doing a demo mile on French Hill. So they're, they're already starting to creep into Johnson, but the problem is that they're doing that under their own power, more or less. Well, they're also doing it under Rob's power. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, there is no, they are under no obligation to give us last mile coverage. Whereas, and, and, and you know, kind of all, like whatever they do, it's basically Comcast. They're just going to come in and they're going to put down what they, they want. And, you know, they can charge what they want. They can stop where they want. They can, you know, 
um, you know, they can do whatever they, they want because it's, it's a private company. Um, and as long as they can, you know, kind of get that access, then there's nothing we can do to stop them. So after they're there, can we spin this area off as Sterling? <laughs>
The alternative then is let the co-op go ahead and do it eventually. Now the co-op has a problem in that they're not allowed to use any rate payer, any electric money to do anything with fiber. So this is where you guys come in right now. They have applied for grants to do, they can't even plan, use their own money to plan for fiber. So they have to get a grant for, from the state funds that are now available to do their plan. They're competing with LCPC for that grant money. Now, the co-op is actually going to build it. LPC is just going to talk about it. You have a delegate, a representative to LCPC, a board member that should, I would urge LCPC to back off trying to get that grant money and leave it available for the co-op. That's my opinion. Under the, uh, under the uh, build, operate, transfer model of public financing, we could, we can, I'm not sure we can do it as one town, but two towns can form a communication and they can float bonds that are non-recourse. They don't go, if someone defaults, they don't go back to the rate payer, or to the taxpayers. Their security is, is, the, is, the, is the fire rate. Um, but it's a municipal bond, so that investors are, investors are snapping them up. This is the experience of UC Fiber. That's how they've been able to finance their network. We could write the bond in such a way. We could use the proceeds, we could forward the proceeds to the builder operator and contractually obligate them to give us the fiber to give them this once it's all paid off, once the notes are retired, we own the fiber. We would continue, we don't want to be in the fiber operator, we don't want to be an ISP, but we would not mind having oversight of the ISP, selecting it and saying, these are the terms, uh, rates of course are negotiable, but you know, we, we're looking for net neutrality, we're looking for all those. Privacy safety. Yeah, all those two <laughs> things in, in your handouts there. Um, that's about the only way we could get that is through the uh, build up the transfer model. If, EC, or if uh, MC5 goes ahead and builds it, nothing we can do. And we can't stop them. We can't stop any, any uh, fiber company from running fiber. That's, uh, and we can't regulate it. No one can regulate it. So MC Fiber has already started, or they're doing a trial. Let's. They haven't, they haven't, built, they haven't oh. built anything yet. Right. But let's they say know. they decide to. Where does that leave us? Where? Well, the only, yeah. the only, well, there's a caveat here. They would like to get some of that community action development grant right money that you folks mm -hmm. have. And you could tie them up a little bit in, in, if you were to extend them a little amount of that fund. But other than that, we got no control. We have no control of them. Yeah, if you if you were to posit to them that you know we will help you develop in Johnson, but under these conditions, right? Um, you know, you could tie up and say you have to go the last mile, or you know. I think I think it gets a little bit trickier when it is going to be a private industry. It becomes trickier to say you know. You know, these are the conditions for net neutrality, these are the conditions for privacy, um, you know, security, just because that, you know, they're going to just operate by their, they're, they're allowed to kind of set their own rules um, and their own pricing and all of these other things. But, um, you know, you can, you can, you can dangle a few things over their heads and say, you know, if you want this, you know. If you want our money, here's our rules. Mm -hmm. So if the co-op goes ahead with theirs, yes. option. Will they go to every residence who doesn't have co-op, from an electric co-op? No. Um, they will only go to residents that, that has power. Their power. Still no. Because no. it would be set up as a separate, as a separate utility. Mm -hmm. But they wouldn't so. own the poles on another power company's telephone poles. No, they can still pay them. They only own... Uh, Richie Weston says they only own 55% of their poles. 
which I was surprised, but they don't own all the poles that carry their electricity. Right, I think there's a shared with the telephone company. Yeah, but, yeah. and other and and there's I think there's 13. I think there's 13 providers just in Lamar County. Yeah, we have. The big thing that we have. I think we have five in Johnson. The the most expensive poles are the roof 15 poles. Those are the ones where the the, the rental fees are really astronomical, mm -hmm. and and but that's also where the density is. I mean, that's an arterial line, and so you kind of have you know. It would look really weird to try to wire Johnson without taking advantage of the you know, and see for that matter. Um, so those are just things that you're just going to have to figure out <laughs> how, to, you know, how to make that happen. But the co-op is in very preliminary. Like I said, they can't spend any money planning, so they don't have a plan. Mm -hmm. Bob, would you say the most expensive poles were? Route 50. Route 50. Or Route 100. Or Route 100. Route 100. Any of the state. Yeah. What if a pole's owned by Consolidated and they don't want you to put your bike around? Legally, they have to let you. Yeah. They do legally. They can take a long time to get away. It's legal. Hmm. And I think Comcast is, I think Consolidated would be a bigger thorn. We own more poles than that. Yeah. So if 70% of the town is currently supplied, right. could probably Comcast or, or Fairpoint. No, that's more. If you include DSL, it, the percentage is higher. It's 70% of collectors. Oh, okay. I can't want to know what, what consolidated so, has. So what is the gap on the amount of people who don't have any type of access? Oh, it's about 400 people. 312 people that yeah. don't have when they don't high have, speed access. don't have high speed access. So they may have access to consolidated. It's just very slow. Yeah. Isn't that dwellings, not people? Yeah, I was say dwellings. Sure. Um, there's only like 150 that don't have anything. Because yeah. DS there's 213 on DSL, 917. So that's um, 1120 out of 1290. So 170 don't have anything. Is consolidated considered high speed? Consolidated. Only if they deliver 25-3 service, which in most cases, in the village, they can probably meet that speed. But if you get a certain amount of feet from a hub, so there's a hub on railroad street, before they get to my house, which is a mile and a quarter down the road, they can only provide 7-1, not very reliably. 3-1 is pretty reliable, but none of that is considered high speed. That's the 25 to 3 speed. And just for the record, you know, if you're talking about people again, the number of people who rely on their internet from the survey for professional work, 25 to 3 is actually not really, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's okay for checking email and, mm -hmm. you know, watching Netflix, but if you're, if you're really working, you know, you're transferring files and you're on a VPN and you're doing all these things, which, you know, you're doing conference calls and, you know, screen shares, then you need better than 25 degrees. So at 25.3, you're in the world of uh, the United States. Uh, we're, we are, you're a second class citizen for competing for mm -hmm. listen to work and stuff. Right, yeah, because it really is, you know, it, it's, it's fine for people who are using the internet in a consumer way. If you're consuming Netflix, if you're shopping on Amazon, if you're checking email or doing Facebook, 25 free will get you by. Um, but yeah, if you're relying on your internet to make your living, you know, um, if you're working from home, then you, you do need stronger um, internet than 25.3. There's just no way around it. And the ones that are getting 25.3 from um, consolidating from DSL also have Comcast available. That's true. So there's 312. That don't have 25. They don't have access to 25.
$4,200 for two people. $300 people. Would there be any advantage to Johnson to ask the co-op to come in and tell us where they are and where they're going? Could we put a crowbar underneath them at all and they don't need it? They have, there is interest in at the co-op. You're dealing with a utility that does not move at lightning speed. There is interest on the board. There are at least three directors that I know of that are interested in being on ISP. We call it being an ISP. They've got to move the rest of the board in that direction. They've got some regulation, regulatory changes to make. So you can lobby one of the directors who's also a legislator. You can lobby Dan Noyes and uh, Matt Hill to get the, get the law changed so that they can at least get that obstacle removed. But they have to go to the members of the co-op to get the charter changed so they can move in that direction. So I don't really see any point. I mean, certainly a lot of them, but they're not going to accomplish very much. I don't think the members would have a problem with them being an ISP. Don't know. I wouldn't think so. This member doesn't. I don't know about the other members. The other thing you're talking about is the, the two the two town districts. And yes. Is there some advantage there? Well, there's the advantage that we can issue those non-recourse bonds to finance it, and then <clears throat> then we have to find someone to, to build and operate. And MC Fiber is one one vehicle. I don't know if EC would be interested. There there are new companies popping up all the time. There's this Rainsfield Telecom that might be interested. I don't know it's on another company. Plus, we're going to talk to Kingdom or hear from Kingdom on next Tuesday. So there, there's a variety of people that could be interested. MC is interested. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so how do you envision the? Uh, you know, like I say, the lion's share of the population has already got something available, so they might not be interested in whatever we could do. We put that out, so we're down the 70% or whatever that may be that are already have access to something. We're left with 30% of the pie. And that last mile is probably the most expensive. What subscription rate is going to, you know, to repay the, the bond and the loan and be uh, uh, affordable to the, uh, if you guys looked at what the subscription rate would be? The break even rate tends to be around $90, $100 per subscriber, which is the basic rate for, for fiber, which includes the people I talked to that have MC and Cambridge Underhill are paying about $100 a month and they also have I don't know if it's television or phone. Yes. In the phone. Um, they're happy with it. Um, they paid $100 a month. They need six per mile. They'd like 10 per mile. Now, MC's plan is not to have drops. They may wire over to Comcast territory, but they don't intend to drop to the to, to, the buildings in Comcast ter territory yet. But that's where the density is. And there are a lot of Comcast, no, there are Comcast customers, I'm going to quantify it. I mean, we only have 90 results out of, out of, out of 1,300. So we don't really know. But there are unhappy Comcast customers that would switch for service, plus, they would switch because it's a fiber network as opposed to a coax network. It's a faster network. Mm -hmm. It's potentially up to a gig in both symmetrical, up and down, a gig. Now, not 25, three, a thousand. Even if it was $90 a month, it's still cheaper because everybody could roll all their service into that, correct? Well, with Comcast, 
Now, if you had fiber optic throughout the whole town, you could get, you could do away with your satellite, you could do away with your telephones. It, it's all, it'd all be rolled into one. It'd actually be cheaper for everybody. If you if you pursue a wire cutter model, yeah, I mean, you know, you might still be paying for like a Netflix or a Hulu subscription. Or right, but I'm just talking just about be. your basic service. Yeah. Because some people spend a hundred dollars a month for satellite, you know, sixty dollars a month for a telephone, forty or fifty dollars a month for DSL or whatever, and that would be cheaper. Yeah, having it all rolled into one. So there are more potential customers than just the three hundred twelve. Exactly. There's also, you know, there's also the uh, option where, you know, for example, if you look at some of these areas where you know that people are not going to be able to afford hundred dollars a month to solar either in the town. Um, the lower income areas, you know, you could, again, you could set up a situation where those people still have access to high-speed internet by introducing a wireless mesh network. Um, this has actually been done in Detroit, in the low income areas of Detroit, of allowing people who otherwise did not have access to um, high-speed internet, and basically created distributed um, wireless systems so that everybody in those neighborhoods actually still has access to, to the internet. Um, they're, they're not getting the, the gigabyte, Fiber up and down, but they're still getting you know a good you know they're they're still getting a good clip. They're still getting better than 25 free through the wireless access um, that you can administer and you can say all right you know you know you don't pay us 100 dollars a month you pay us 20 dollars a month or something like that which is a little bit more affordable um, and that reduces the infrastructure cost because it's wireless um, you just have to be able to like plug into the router basically. Um, and then again, you know, you've got the situation where Johnson doesn't have haves and have nots um, with regards to internet access. So. Where we go? So we'll get a report after the Kingdom Fiber meeting. Yeah. Well, yeah, some other. Yeah. We're, we're going to work at the co ops. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and why is that because you're an institution already? No, because I'm all the time. <laughs> um, so I, I think at this point we would be looking for the, you know, either the blessing or the, you know, will there she from um, the select board on whether or not we want to pursue a fiber option. Um, obviously, you know, we don't have all the answers because we don't have the kingdom fiber, but this is sort of, you know, they should have. It seems to me that doing anything but fiber is short-sighted. I agree. Yep. <laughs> I think the committee agrees. I mean, that's, you know. There is, there is one other point that we talked about. We'd like to have booth space at time of Yeah. Like that what? Booth space at time of So. We want to be next to the five. We want to be next to the five. <laughs> that's important. Um, the other thing, but one of the things that, um, so you know who wasn't able to come tonight, um, uh, she actually did a lot of work with the, the people who worked on the mesh networks in Detroit. And one of the things that they did was called, um, they called it DiscoTech, which was um, short for Discover Technology. And the idea was that it was an informational booth that people could come up and they could learn about things like net neutrality, about differences between the different, you know, um, internet service delivery options like fiber and wireless and cable. Um, they could learn about, um, you know, what, you know, what is internet privacy and, and, and all these other things. And, and so we were thinking that that might not be a bad way to kind of, again, like kind of continue to further educate, but also gauge interest from the town on how to move forward with this project. Sounds good. Good. <clears throat> I'd support it anyway I can. I'm sure the rest of the board will do. You have to ask the Historical Society about the pie location. <laughs> But I'm sure we can make space available at town. <laughs> I mean, we could just start making pies of our own. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Yeah.
month at a time. Time to time. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. You're doing Thank great you. work. Thank you. Brian, you might as well get right into your report. All right. Hey. How you doing? Good. How are you? Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. So we've heard back from the uh, League of Cities and Towns about uh, the legal review for our uh, right-of-way access policy. Um, so this would cover work in the right-of-way, driveway permits and things like that. Our current policy needs an update. Um, and we, if you recall, uh, we wrote some improvements using the VLCT policy as a, a model to start from uh, and then adopting it to kind of take over some of the effects of our current existing uh, highway access and right-of-way policy. Um, then we asked the League of Cities and Towns to do the review for us because we based it on their model policy and thought they would be relatively affordable and uh, I think that their return looks pretty affordable. It will cost between 276 and 460 dollars for them to do the legal review. So you need yep. act approval from the board, right? Yep. What's the board's pleasure? So for up to a four sixty. Not to exceed four sixty. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? Second. Got a motion second. Any more discussion? Right. Seeing none, all those in favor signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, now we'll get that up for review and we should have that up for, uh, we should have that back relatively soon. Okay. Um, next item, uh, the details for the racial justice workshop. I've had uh, a couple brief conversations with Laura uh, Yang about uh, when she'd be able to come out and uh, do this and her schedule is pretty accommodating, uh, that of her organization is pretty accommodating, so we, would be best to um, make the request of, of what works for the board and the community about when we want to host this. What's the board's thoughts? Any particular time frame? How long did she say she would do the workshop for? Do you remember? Uh, two hours, four hours, I forget. I believe that it was going to be closer to four hours. That uh, was what we were originally talking about, that it was, we talked about a couple different models, so I'm sorry that I don't recall exactly. Well, we were talking about having kind of, a, I think we're going to do the workshop and discussion uh, on the same day, and I believe that was going to be four hours. And that'd be a Saturday? Yeah. Yeah, that, that was based on uh, kind of the board's original description for this, is looking at a Saturday better part of the day. Uh, the other option is we could split it up into two days and do a kind of listening session and then come back for a mm -hmm. conversation. But I, that was kind of, I, I didn't really think that that was the board's inclination for that. So it's not you like a one to five type thing. Yeah. But that's kind of, this is kind of our opportunity to specify some of that, that I think Saturday makes sense one to five sounds like a good time to me, but we've got to pick some of the specific details uh, and then we'll make it fit. Well, we are into, uh, for the board, we're going to be heading into bo uh, budget season, so that we're going to be uh, attending meetings as it is for the general public if we want participation, we're heading into holiday times, so a typically a good time to get most people to come out is the January, February time frame. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I guess so. Second or third weekend in January maybe? Sounds Probably funny. something like that. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, Early afternoon, so about like a one to five, noon to four, kind of around that time. Totally flexible, whatever works. Okay. Yeah, whatever's 
flex or works with her. Yep. Oh, one yes, sorry. Yeah. And there'll be options for follow-up discussions about other particular topics. Uh, the initial uh, discussion is going to focus on uh, implicit and explicit biases. Uh, but then we'll have options for deeper dives on other, you know, kind of more concentrated content areas if, if we want to do this again in the future. But we're going to start with the uh, implicit and explicit biases. I don't feel strongly either way, uh, but just the thought that uh, to have the, uh, the workshop first, right? Is that correct? Workshop and discussion? Is that how it works? I, uh, yeah, I believe so. Uh, it might be worthy to have the workshop and then have the people time to digest it and then you bring up the discussion perhaps another time. Yeah, I don't feel strongly about it, but it's just a thought. That was an option that we discussed. Um, I, my feeling was that that didn't seem like it was going to be as popular of an option, but uh, that's certainly something that Poor has offered if we're interested in breaking it up over uh, a couple days. And let me ask, if we did two days, do you think we would lose people? if they came to the discussion and weren't part of the workshop. Okay. Well, I, I don't get to vote, but I vote for to do the whole thing, do the four hours. You're going to bring people together. Two hours actually is not a long time on topics like that. Do it, and then if you want to follow up, I think that's great. But I think splitting it in two to begin with, I just don't think it's going to give you the concentrated mm -hmm. attention that you want. And I don't know that, that everyone's going to come out for a second one, but it seemed to me do the whole thing, and then if you want more, great. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't start by breaking it up. I think we would get that to up. Good point. Kim? And you may be able to get a local facilitator to continue the discussion, you know, say, you know, where do we go from here, and find some bullet points, and be able to say, people who are interested, let's, you know, set a date for the next discussion and, and mm -hmm. keep it running so that it's not just kaboom and then di dies, that it, 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 because I'm, I'm assuming that this is our baby steps and that we're going to want to keep going. So um, I would say that that could be a goal of the... Jasmine? Has a location been chosen yet? Or not? No, we haven't really... I guess we would get a feel for how many people we anticipate are going to yeah. be there. Yeah. It's over 49, we wouldn't be able to have it here. <laughs> Uh, it's, four, it's four hours, correct? Yeah. 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 Uh, that, that's our target time, is four hours. <coughs> um, yeah, we, we've got a couple options for where we might be able to locate it, but it, we'll, we'll have to publish something and get a few RSVPs and make a, uh, an educated guess on how, what our attendance is going to be. Uh, and yeah, our, our first choice would be having it here if the attendance is less than 49 people. Mm -hmm. Well, if we have more people, we do have a number of options uh, for other places. Uh, and I expect that that's probably going to be what we need to do. Maybe when we set a date, we can <clears throat> reach out to the elementary school and do a little survey. Or yeah, exactly. Because yeah. mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm thinking. They're going to be booked, yeah. Their scheduling is going to be very difficult on mm -hmm. Saturdays with uh, soccer, but I think uh, I can speak for Greg. Uh, no, the June's book on January or Saturday now until March. Yeah. Nine to nine. We've got Jenna's promise has uh, community facilities also, but mm -hmm. have been offered broadly. But we'd have to make a specific request if we want to use it. but. Uh, I think that would probably be our first choice, but we know that the gym is pretty heavily used in the sense of limited capacity. So I think that I don't I don't think we might 
we might not have that as an option, but I think that would be kind of our our first choice is to use the the resources that we already have. Uh, but then we'd have to look outside of our, our usual resources if that's not going to be available. Kyle, are you saying we should uh, set a date right now? We could I set think a date right now. Well, mm -hmm. you gave me a couple dates to work with. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. second and third right. Saturday in January. Let, um, let Brian negotiate. Well. Right. And, and I'll work out exact details with. Uh, okay. Is the gym booked on Sundays as well? Is it? Not that I know. Of. I know many Metro has it. Okay. On Saturdays. I just take lunch. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Okay, we can, we can work that out. Space is another possibility. Space. I don't know that that's used on a Saturday during the day. Yeah, I, I I think the college would be one of our options also. I mean, not really picking where exactly we're going to go, but. Uh, we don't know how many people we're going to have. We don't know what kind of needs that she's going to have. Uh, but we got time to set that. So yeah, yeah. And as soon as I, I work on a date with her, we'll start circulating the date, get an idea of what our attendance is going to be, and then that'll help us narrow down what our requirements are. You know, we'll also get a little bit deeper description about what the program is going to entail, what kind of resources she needs. Of you know, does she need a projector? Does she need a sound system? You know, a lot of that depends on how many people are here. If it's a small number, she's not going to, you know, she and the other facilitators won't need a sound system, but if we're getting really big attendance, we're going to need, you know, amplification and other things. And so we're going to have to figure that out. But we need, we need to answer a few questions first. Okay. Uh, we got some questions. We have more questions. Another question. This board would go to this workshop. Would town, um, would staff of the town, and also the village trustees be expected to go? Like who? Everyone will be invited. Everyone is invited. Okay. Yeah. There'll be nobody excluded. No one excluded, but are there um, expectations in place for certain? Like for employees, we can't make an expectation because they're not being paid. Right. Right. If we wanted to pay them, we could require them to go. But mm -hmm. could you swap some hours? Could you say four hours of you know, Give time? Four hours of snow. Well, just four hours. Versus, you know, take an hour each week for uh, you know one hour off each week of December, and then four hours on this one day. It just seems like it's a great resource, and you're put, probably putting up some money for it. And I thought that that was one of the reasons why. Not I think we should offer it. My own opinion is we should offer it, and it's up to them. And I think the complexity of uh, arranging time is fairly difficult. Could you offer that as a, 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 an idea, though, if they were offered an hour off each week? That 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 would be sort of almost a paying thing for them. That would be the investment the town was putting in to having their employees attend. It There's no sweet. reason why we couldn't consider that. It sweetens the deal a bit. I just, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, actually. So, okay. if you were able to do it during the work week, then it's a hypothetical question at this point because it's not on the table, but if it was during the work week, would the board support having employees go as a mandatory training? We could do it. Unfortunately for us and the most of the public, mm -hmm. that might not be an option for them to, you know, be able to go. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, we're doing it more for the public and our right. convenience yeah. for time-wise. Okay. Anything else? If not, no. and number three, you said you we're not prepared. Right? No. Um, if I can. If it helps, a number of employees have expressed an interest in attending. Awesome. Uh, 
So I don't think that it's going to be necessary to get good attendance from the employees. Uh, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that we can do some other things to make it attractive and interesting and get a pretty good attendance for it. Um, yeah, I think there, there's interest. If we serve pizza with meat, maybe we could go. Uh, <laughs> I just said one of us is vegetarian. I didn't say the whole board was vegetarian. <laughs> I'm sorry. We had five uh, cheese pizzas the other day during exercise. <laughs> okay. <All right. sighs> Not going to live that down. <laughs> So, uh, very brief update, uh, the town supported uh, making the application for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Healthy Communities Award. Uh, we have submitted for that and it's been accepted. Um, so, we, we're, we've gone ahead. We had a really good coalition of folks working together on that. Uh, Janice Promise donated a lot of their time and effort uh, about helping make that happen. Uh, Cheslov was a big help. Um, with Daniel's organization. Uh, that's Northern Vermont Recovery Center. Mm -hmm. Northern Vermont Central Vermont Recovery Center. Yeah, North Central Vermont Recovery Center uh, donated some of their time as well. Um, and the college was uh, very helpful when it came to uh, some of our efforts, and they, they put in their broad support for this as well. Uh, yeah, it was a good community effort, uh, and we've completed the application and will be considered for the next round. Okay. Um, next, you've got the uh, draft contract for the uh, fire service. So again, this isn't the final contract. The village uh, has not submitted their costs for next year. But this is just the updated language that included our request for, uh, excuse me, our request for having a little bit more controls about uh, what to do if we signed a contract and then got voted down at town meeting, or the reverse happened for the village of it. They signed a contract and then at village meeting they uh, got their client. And I. Uh, cleaning up our understanding of the start and end dates for the mm -hmm. contract as well. Um, with your permission, I'll make the recommended changes and forward a copy to the village. With board's pleasure. It's no such a change in coverage, it's just a matter of timing. Yeah, pretty much. It, it's, it gives us and the village ways out, but not, uh, not capriciously. It, 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 it's gotta be. Right with cause, but it just defines what that, a little bit about what that cause is and gives a procedure for what happens if somebody, one or the other of us, has to withdraw. Uh, I know that there was some concern about, you know, using this as a, a negotiation tactic or something to be able to enter or leave the contract and that it doesn't enable anything like that. It's uh, just a little bit more comprehensive uh, and covering more ground. Okay. So is there a consensus on Brian sending it forward? Sure. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, update on the light industrial park. <laughs> um, so I wanted to brief the board on the Economic Development Authority grants that we're pursuing right now. Um, we have, uh, let's see, I will, Eric filled you in a little bit, so I, I apologize if I'm kind of rehashing a little bit, but uh, when we didn't get the Northern Borders Regional Commission grant, uh, a portion of that grant was going to come from the Economic Development Authority. Uh, the EDA, which is another federal agency that deals with uh, projects like this. The, through our conversations with the EDA, we've picked up a couple of the threads from that grant application and developed them into a new grant application that acts as a different 
pot of money. Uh, and there's two that we're looking at right now that are both uh, disaster recovery related. Um, the uh, two pots of money are for the uh, 2017 and 2018 uh, calendar years. That would be a weather event that was in 2017 that Johnson was lightly affected, but it was a declared disaster for Lamont County. So we are covered in the federal disaster de declaration, even though we weren't as severely uh, impacted locally. But it was a declared disaster, and it we were very vulnerable because of our general vulnerability to flooding and uh, weather conditions. You know, th this is not anything new, even if that disaster didn't hit us as hard as others, we're still very vulnerable. So we're applying under that aspect, even though, again, that 2017 is a little bit less impactful locally. Uh, if that d isn't successful, we'll be applying under the 2018 calendar year, which includes the ice jam, which is definitely has a high local impact. The application process for that one's going to be a little bit different, and the turnaround time on that one will be uh, quite a bit faster in terms of our response and readiness to, in order to receive the federal funds. Uh, both of these we're looking at uh, probably about three months out for a decision. Um, the conversations I've had with the uh, Feds are very positive. Uh, they like this. They like us for this application. We qualify for these grants. They have three criteria for qualifying communities, and we meet all three criteria, uh, which is pretty unusual. So we're we're a good target for this. Uh, that we meet it for federally declared disaster. We meet it for community need, uh, based on the statistic of. Uh, uh, per capita income uh, is their their qualification for that. And the third is that this is something that's opened up to us because of our designation as an economic opportunity zone. Uh, so again, those are the three criteria for selecting uh, applicable communities. We meet all three. We have a federally, you know, we have a great deal of need. We can write a good narrative for it. it it's pretty likely. Uh, and both of these would be for the both of the applications we're making would be for the full grant amount, or for the full road construction and infrastructure amount, uh, plus the final engineering study. So we're looking at a uh, little over a million dollars for each of these applications. Say again. A million for each or a million? A million for each, but we wouldn't be going, it'll be one or the other. We won't be taking $2 million for the project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, these require a substantial local match, right? They do require a substantial local match. Uh, this is the cash for it. Um, the uh, in-kind contributions are eligible, but to be competitive, they want to see a uh, local stake and a kind of a guaranteed local match. So that they want to see us secure 20%. So it'll be uh, in excess of $200,000. Could we secure that from our loan fund? Not from our loan fund. Uh, it doesn't have that. Um, but our loan fund would probably be a component of our right. the amount the money we raise. It could be a majority. Part. Yeah. I'm confused by that. What? The loan fund is eligible, but we the funds are eligible, money. but we right. can't. Right. We don't have a mechanism. The rules we wrote for the loan fund don't allow us to loan out that much money for. Well, sure, but a portion of it. Yeah. I mean, we change the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Who makes those rules? <laughs> yeah. Um, 
<laughs> so the, the law, that would be a, compo a part of the portfolio that makes it up. Yeah. Uh, and an important thing to remember is that those in-kind contributions are still eligible for match, but we have to, to be competitive, um, we have to ha be able to demonstrate a way that we have of raising the $200,000. How do we do this without reaching our promise to the uh, citizens that, that this was going to be all grant funded? That um, was our intent. We, we did. We we did tell the voters our intent was to go after grants, but I don't believe it was a in a promise. But, yeah, I, don't, I don't think it was a promise either. But and I, I think going back and back the minutes. And even any investment we make in this property by the sale of the lots will repay any town expense. Exactly. Um, um, and again, what we're going to have to do, we don't need to make the decision tonight. We'll submit an application. Uh, right now, uh, we're reviewing what they call a nexus statement, uh, which is uh, a statement that we're writing that uh, South, Seth and uh, Ben Rose from Vermont Emergency Management have helped us write uh, that talks about the the nexus of need, opportunity, and uh, you know relief that this will provide, and we're chopping that around for the uh, 2017 eligibility. If that's if that looks pretty good, we'll complete our application for the 2017 eligibility. If that doesn't work out, we're going to complete our application for the 2018 eligibility and have a nexus statement for the 2018 incident. Again, the 2018 incident has a greater local impact, uh, but the application process for that requires a little bit faster turnaround. Uh, it'll be 30 to 60 days uh, after the application is submitted that we have to have our second round application, or let's see, it'll be 30 days for them to get a response to us, and then we'll have an additional uh, 30 to 60 days to give them a, a response back on uh, the second round application. Charlie? My recollection is that when we voted the same, Purchase the property, that the infrastructure, all the infrastructure, all the infrastructure is going to cost a million and twenty thousand. Is that what you're going to do? All the infrastructure, the water, the sewer, the roads, mm -hmm. subdivision, the flat planning, all that is going to be covered by this? The road and the infrastructure, this subdivision, uh, it'll be in the plan, but I don't think that. How can you have roads without a subdivision without a plan? We'll, we'll have that with the final engineering study. There is a design or yeah, there is, yeah. the intent was to do the the main artery and then all of the feeds to the different lots, they could custom build it to the So we wouldn't be dealing with the different lots. It's just you're gonna have all the water and all the sewer and all the road and all the power. Up through the the, the parcel, yeah. Right, and then the tenants. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But it's all going to be done. It'll go up to the curb, but for the whole length of the road, which will enable construction on the entire property. For near 200,000. Uh, a local match of. of no, no, 200,000 yeah. mm -hmm. A little over, once you round up the, you know, the construction's yeah. a little yeah. over a million, and we have to do the That's final engineering study. Price. What's that? And that's in addition to the purchase price. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's where the grants are. Yes. All good What's that? How many, how many lots will you have there? Was there five? Uh, projected five. Five, but they're not set, so depending on the needs, if one person came in that's got a huge business, they want to take the whole thing, yeah. they could. But some of the lots could be split into two yeah. separate businesses also. Yeah. So it's Maybe flexible. It's so could you pre-sell off to get your 200000 
there's been we haven't we, successfully we've been peddling them but there a lot of the businesses are not interested until there's we're further along would you like to buy the first one <laughs> It is possible uh, that we could, if we can sell the lots, we can use a portion of those proceeds uh, as reserving that fund, or reserving those funds to pay the local match. So if we're successful, that would be another way that we can make up the 200,000. Um, we're also still eligible with this particular type of grant, that 20% match to fill that gap funding if there are other grants of, yeah. that we can uh, secure, we could we fill that too. And in kind work too. Yes. Yeah, we will probably most likely do in kind work, so we will not really realize a two hundred thousand dollar cash out of pocket commitment. But we have to be prepared and show that we would. Yeah, we could also issue municipal bonds yeah. and sell them to the general public. Okay. We, we have a, we have other option. We have a variety of options for how we make up the two hundred thousand, but we have to have uh, at the beginning effectively two hundred thousand dollars in cash uh, in order for us to be competitive with it. Kim, I didn't recall. Did, did uh, have we jumped through all the hoops of Act two hundred and fifty and all that? Or is oh yeah. That, yeah, yeah, that was quite well ago. Uh, a, a handful of, the, of permitting things are still required, but they're part of the uh, estimate that we received for the final engineering. Uh, so anything that isn't already done is covered as part of the uh, money that we're seeking right now. To answer your question, most of the time they are guaranteed by the town. They are guaranteed. Most of the time they are guaranteed. I would say. Question. Very few municipal bonds are issued without it. Nat, some type of a warranty out of the Nat, go ahead. Uh, so these sound like pretty substantial applications and I'm wondering how they fit into your workload in the next couple of months with budgeting and uh, talk good about that would be the uh, uh, second part of the conversation. Okay. Um, did you have an opportunity to talk to I did talk to L C P C today. Um, so this one was a pretty significant time commitment so far, and I'm, I've got it right at the finish line for completing the round one application. The round two application uh, has a very tight turnaround from when we hear that we qualify for it. Our clock starts ticking immediately for then submitting the remainder of uh, the application materials and everything else that we're going to need for round two. It is probably worthwhile for us to look into uh, finding some assistance specific to this. Mm -hmm. uh, that is also another cost that we can roll into the hiring a grant administrator is something that we can roll in or a project administrator is something that we can roll into the grant application. And I think it's probably going to be worthwhile, especially given the uh, requirements that we're going to be facing with FEMA requirements and everything else that's going to happen with the disaster we had on Friday and uh, yeah. the beginning of budget season. Yeah. And you're saying LCPC could probably... LCPC is a uh, good so candidate for that. this and uh, so is Duncan Hastings. Mm -hmm. Did they indicate they could take this on? And uh, LCPC does have the capacity to okay. take this on and they would be able to assist us with... Um, the gap funding and the whole project. Yeah. Uh, all, of the, all of the research and getting creative about how we come up with the uh, $200,000 gap. Uh, pursuing other grants, uh, we did talk about sales of the parcels as being a pretty high on our list of, uh, our wish list of, that would be great if we could pre-sell a couple of these, but. Uh, okay. Yeah. What's the board's pleasure? Uh, have interest in uh, if LCPC is indicated they can take this on, uh, get something off of Brian's plate. 
Uh, Seth has done these grant applications before for other communities. Oh, great. Uh, so he's got experience working with this office on these types of grants. Uh, Are you guys comfortable with it? What's the charge? Absolutely. Any charge? Yeah. There'll there be will be a charge for it. Like how much? Uh, we'll roll it into the grant application, but it's going to depend on the specifics of what we negotiate with OCPC about what the, how many hours we're going to get Seth for, and uh, some of the other towns that have hired LCPC to administer grants like this uh, have also taken a few hours from their uh, finance department at LCPC in addition to sense grant writing. Uh, so we, we'll have to negotiate a specific contract with them before we get a, a dollar amount out. And you don't think that you can do it on your own? My I've gotten it this far and it's gone well, I think, but uh, I think it's just a safety net. I think we yeah. need to remember that Brian had a lot on his plate before. Now, after this flood event, we're going to have FEMA coming in within the next few days, do a preliminary uh, on site uh, visit looking at our flooding. He's going to be involved in all of that. All of our roads, he's going to have piles of mountain uh, paperwork to fill out. And that doesn't even go into the Scribner Bridge whole project. That's, he's going to get consumed by that. And, and we don't want to lose momentum on right. this. Right, that's a, that's a fact. Yeah. No. So I, I think LCPC is probably probably a great choice for us. Yeah. But and we have plenty available in our budget to do this. Yeah. Yeah. And it'll be reimbursable. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do but it can't cost more than a couple of grand. I wouldn't anticipate more than a couple of grand, but it, it'll depend on the specifics. Okay. All right. Um, again, yeah, I agree with Eric about comment about momentum. If I can uh, you know, toot my own horn a little bit, that I feel pretty good about turning the uh, declination that we received from Northern Borders Regional Commission into a new successful application of being able to pick up those threads about what worked for that and finding a new opportunity with it. We've really got some momentum behind right. this right now. And we don't want to lose it. No, we'll move on. Uh, and Seth has been working with me on this application so far, so there's not really a period of having him to come up to speed. It'll mostly just be kind of a, an official handoff, and then we'll get some of his time. Okay. Good. So I think the board was in agreement. If LCPC can take the lead, yep. you'll still be involved because anything, you're still the town rep. So yes. It's not like it's totally off your plate anyways. Okay, right. we're ready to go into dilapidated buildings. Yes. This is looking pretty good now, isn't it? Well, so. I'm waiting for Doug's review. I see a lot of highlighter. I, uh, maybe I should lie in the weeds to everybody else this time. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can all have a good time until you start talking. Uh, I, I, I did print a couple extra copies, though. Okay. Not enough for everybody, but uh, there's two. I, I printed out the uh, the Vermont statutes that, that it references. You know, someone was uh, I hate the word creative, but someone was very smart in how they um, used the nuisance statute to bootstrap a town that doesn't have appropriate regulations that allows us to do structures and things like that to give us standing in the cases where we have what we would call blighted buildings. And uh, the, uh, my only question in the whole thing is on page two is that they say habitability shall be defined in accordance with uh, 9 VSA chapter 139 and just in my reading it on my computer screen, I couldn't figure out where there was a definition. That's a rental housing code. Um, and so I'd be, I'd be curious about that. But I, I, like the, uh, I like the construct of this. What it does is it, it gives us an ability to have a designated town officer 
look at things, gives, uh, gives uh, is a, has a notice requirement, gives uh, people the right to request hearings, and uh, there's some negotiations involved, uh, and I think it gives us standing to deal with problems that have existed for quite a while, and we have vacant buildings that are eyesores and, blight and blighting the neighborhood. I, I liked it. Uh, it's a great improvement over the, uh, over the fire ordinance, which was uh, you know, basically an abandoned building ordinance, abandoned structures. So, um, well, that's very good, Doug. <laughs> yeah. Quite surprised. <laughs> Case well, I'm pleasantly surprised, actually. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, I, will, I will say, you know, I think there's a need in this community for this. If you look around and see the buildings that are empty and uh, the effect that they have, I think that there's a great utility for the community in this. So who, sorry, um, who will be enforcing this should, should we pass it? The select board ultimately is the is basically the hearing. Well, we would have to name an that. inspection. You, you have an officer you could name. It could be your constable, or you could name. I would suggest that we name, you know, uh, the help. service officer. Help, help. help the service officer. officer? No, I, I think I think it ought to be Brian. You know, even though because it's it's an important job that you really want done right and. Uh, by the rules, and uh, if there, there's considerable pressure on citizens, and they need to be dealt with fairly, and uh, uh, want someone who is who could do that. Getting back to your first uh, question, uh, so basically you're just saying take care of number four and reference that properly, and you'd be happy with the whole thing. Yeah, I would be happy if I if I could figure out what. Uh, what the standard is there. Well, then we can move forward with this then. Get it going. And this is the one that came from our attorney? Yes. Yeah. And it's something that other towns have had? I they... believe that they, I believe that this was implemented in another town. Okay. Uh, it's, I have to go through my email to get the, the description of it. This could be one that was a draft for another town. Mm -hmm. uh, does this have more teeth for enforcement than our solid waste worker? Not especially. Um, that's something we should be aware of is uh, our penalty is to assess fees. Yeah. Uh, you see section 10 on page four, first offense, second offense, third offense, and so on, we can assess fees. Um, but like in our solid waste ordinance, if somebody has no ability to pay our fees, but. Where did that end? Yeah. Hmm. These fees aren't that really high. No. But it's every day. It compounds very quickly. Yeah. I think there was injunctive power there too. One of the statutes they cited. Yeah, it says here under the penalty, seek enforcement of this ordinance by injunctive or other appropriate relief and collection of any penalty. I guess that that would be you know um, that would be a question for the lawyer if if uh, and I, well, I, when I was looking at it I was certain that there was uh, something yeah there. the last paragraph under penalties is the injunctive. So totally supportive of the spirit of the thing, our, our solid and I with our solid waste ordinance. It's just that 
puts an expectation on that. We we set an expectation that says that we're going to be able to enforce this thing that we really can't. Yeah. At the end of the day, we don't have much for teeth. Well, I think I'm the Superior Court. So if we get number four taken care of uh, under section three tonight and answered properly, we could we could approve this. I would just I would want to answer the question about uh, injunction that we have the ability to to go to court to seek an injunction to enforce this as well as a civil penalty. Well, doesn't uh, that imply that under offenses? Under paragraph three on penalties. What page are you on? Page five. five. I think so. Okay. No. What would an injunction do for us? Uh, against somebody who has no ability to pay. We aren't after payment, we're after performance. So if they have no capacity to pay or perform the action requested. If they refuse to perform, what happens? Well, I mean more, what if, what if they don't have the ability to, to pay for demolition of a building? Can they forfeit the building and the property under it that we now own the lot? Well, that would be an answer for the Superior Court to decide, wouldn't it? It's a good question with the solid waste, solid waste ordinance. You're often dealing with people that don't have um, real That's estate our, property investments that you can repossess. Mm -hmm. In this situation, they presumably have property that they're not living on that is of some value that could be taken over. Yeah, that's theoretically. Right. If the so I think is. that covers that under. Well, I mean, <laughs> we might see it that way. I'm not sure a court would actually see it that way. Yeah, well. Or the law sees it that way. Would you have to have something that's stated if you put a lien on the property? Yeah, that's in here. And we can do that currently with the solid waste ordinance too, but it doesn't compel people to. The, the bind we have in the solid waste ordinance is what do we do for a person who has, who can't pay to clean up the property? We can fine them again for not cleaning up the property. File a loan before close, clean it up and sell it. I would say it's under section 6D uh, on page 3. So if they don't file a remediation plan, or if they fail to draft a plan, or if they fail to comply with subsection C, we got injunctive relief, enforcement remedies, penalties, without limita limitation, <coughs> abatement of common law nuisances, public health, repair, demolition, stru structures, etc. Mm -hmm. Do we have a something similar language in our solid waste? I have to look to see if it's as complete as this. If we don't, we should. Yeah, I mean. This seems com pretty complete. I'd have to review the solid waste to see. Since this, since this uh, basically um, does away with all similar ordinances, we ought to see if our solid waste ordinance is a competing one that's repealed by this. That's a good question. This comes up with a, comes up with an, and enforces a Pretty broad definition of nuisance. Mm -hmm. I would send that to them and ask them that. Hey, I uh, wonder if you thought about some of these buildings might be loaded with flat glass pastas. Because, you know, that can get pretty expensive. If the town's going to take their property, then. Might not be worth it. Then that's. You're, you're also your you know, fuel. Uh, ground testing uh, could yeah. be quite a little 
of uh, liability here. That's my concern when it comes to if we have to take injunctive relief against somebody who has no ability to pay to do the demolition themselves, when we take that on, uh, that could be a pretty big uh, bottomless pit. But yeah. well, we have to do something. This is a tool that when you're dealing with someone who has a, they've got a deed, they likely have a mortgage, uh, they've got insurance companies, you know, their ability to, you know, this brings another force on them that uh, hopefully will cause them to say, oh, I'll fix this rather than just leave it like it is, you know. The considerations of what the, the town steps into by becoming an owner of a hazardous waste site is something we obviously need to consider when we're looking at what the remedies we would choose. Good answer. It's not an easy answer. So you would <laughs> For the benefit of the taxpayer. Can we move this forward then, Mr. Chairman? Uh, I think Doug's got a couple of good questions that we want to get answered. First, but we could the board comfortable. Uh, we ought to get the answers by next meeting and just straightened out and prove it. The next meeting, the board take it at our regular meeting. Take a vote on the next meeting. I'm not being presumptuous. And then, how do we let people know? Well, it'll be posted. It won't mm -hmm. take effect for 60 days, 60 days mm -hmm. because there's the opportunity for the voters to raise a petition. Require a town wide vote. So you want to go back and get the answers to at least the question on section three? Yep. Was there any other questions or concerns? The relationship to our solid waste ordinance. Oh, we have the solid waste ordinance, the definitions on habitability. Uh, those are the only two questions I'm taking to the attorney. And for who it was, that we do have a definition on page two under section three D. It does say the inspection official shall need a town health officer, mm -hmm. assistant health officer, or such person is designated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I, I wanted to. I think we should ask them, have they, if they've done this for any towns, have they had any, how has it worked? Uh, yeah. Has there been any enforcement action? Or, uh, that's a great question. I feel like Morseville's really cracked down. They've tried. They've tried. With some success. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, we've come a long way on this, that's for sure. <clears throat> so you all, almost got it. You're all set, Brian? What we got the questions? Yep. Anything so again, just else? a quick review. I've got how does this interact with our solid waste and in any other town ordinances? We've also got one about occupation of a nuisance property, an odd old older ordinance that this might interact with. Uh, but how does this interact with other ordinances? Definition of habitability uh, and who. Who else has implemented this? And then I'll reach out to them and, and have a discussion about their enforcement actions and how it's worked out for them. You should send them our ordinances that you think might conflict with it. That, that's my plan. It, it is, Solid Voice is the big one. Uh, I don't remember the title of the other one, but there, there's an, we have an odder old one about, uh, it sounds like it was written with the idea of houses for college students, like having I mean, too many people occupying a house and being too loud consistently, that's a, okay. I don't recall it, but I believe it uses the word nuisance in it, so this could supersede and interact with that one. Mm -hmm. And unanticipated voice, I'm going to check that too. Okay, uh, the other thing, the next one I added was a storm event. Uh, first of all, I just want Thank all of you that 
we're available and participating. Uh, you know, I was really happy and impressed with the work that you guys did. You took a lot of things off my focus and shoulders. You, you guys took care of the people upstairs. I didn't have to worry about them. You guys were eyes and ears out there for me, which I appreciate. Seems like every time I try to go out, I get to the first place and I'm stuck. I can't go any further, but um, I really appreciated the feedback that you guys were feeding in. And I just thought, you know, your contributions were huge. I think overall, it went well. Uh, I think we're getting used to or accustomed to what we need to do. And I'm not talking about just us, I'm talking about the Sterling Market, the post yeah. office, uh, the library. They all are in there, they're putting their floodgates up. Uh, Pomelo had a whole team here. They were dumping sand to protect the properties. And then they had it removed during the night and had the businesses open back up next morning for business. Um, we're, we're getting too good at this, and I think because we've had too much practice. Um, one thing that I indicated in an email to you guys is I think that it, I would like permission to be able to look at maybe possible more uses for the constables. Um, I did ask Tracy to go do a wellness check um, because at that when that call came in, um, the, uh, the deputies were split between us and Hyde Park and, and uh, Wolka. Uh, the fire department got toned out. There was nobody to go do this wellness check. I asked Tracy to do it. We had a, a point where we needed to shut down Route 15 because it was not safe. And we did not have the resources to do it. Uh, we had a lot of trouble during the storm getting AOT to respond. Uh, and of course, if we had shut it down, we own it. And it was a better remedy for them to do it. However, if we did have our own constables, we could, and they are trained in traffic control, we could have utilized them to do some of that kind of work. I think that could have been valuable. And there could be other uses for them during that event. As we found out during the event, um, you know, we sort of depend on the fire department to help us. Well, they had a structure fire, and then they had that gas tank leak. Uh, so they were occupied. Uh, Roger had all hands on deck. Every deputy was called in that could come in. And he was split between Wolka, Hyde Park, and Johnson. So we had one deputy here. And that wasn't enough to do what we needed to do. But, so again, I just reiterate where I think the constables, we could utilize them more, just in what capacity, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I open it up for what you guys' thoughts were. Um, feedback, pros, cons, how you think it went? Kyle did an outstanding job with that family upstairs. You know, went on Facebook and got donations and stuff for them. And, really took care of that family that the fam leads that were displaced she did an excellent job yeah. that was a big community effort but, but she was we, were, at it we were on our own because the red cross couldn't get here right. they were stuck up in newport well that was a big lesson for me was that because we've said in the past we even training exercises oh if there's going to be people displaced the red cross will come they'll take care of them well the red cross couldn't get here. couldn't get here for four or five hours, and yeah, we were able to, thanks to Kyle and the generosity of the community, it got me thinking about what we could do in thinking that if I'd lost my house to a structure fire, the last place in the world I'd want to be, though I guess I'd be happy to be anywhere, it would be in this room, and this room is very functional, but it's just not, uh, <laughs> not family friendly. Not family friendly when you've got a toddler and an infant. I was wondering, one idea I had is if we could connect and get some people uh, from the area churches, leaders in the area churches on our call sheet, that would, the faith community around might be really effective, you know, if 
um, we didn't have uh, someone like Kyle on the board who could rally up here and families, but if we could get, um, as I said, people from the faith community, because they could really put out through their church um, social media word that we need things like diapers and formula and clothes and even a place for people, someone to stay for I the afternoon. You have that list, right? We developed it during the, uh, the ice cream. We did. I'll have to go back and, and look for that, but yeah, we did develop a little bit better contact list with them, but they're not part of our regular call out. In the, in the past, uh, Red Cross has been here, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the for a variety of reasons, the Red Cross wasn't able to make it to us till many hours later. And if it was 20 or 30 people, we would be just chaos, right? But yeah. if we could relocate those folks to a church or something that seems like uh, something churches would be well suited to do. Let me give the board an opportunity first, then I'll open it to the audience. The other thing I wanted to comment on is just to see our fire department work in real time. Um, we're just so fortunate in this community to have such an excellent fire department. And um, the work that they did all day long was really incredible. So uh, I'm really appreciative of that. You were swamped. <laughs> yeah, I, I was at a duck marsh, you know, <laughs> calling in. Which, which actually prompted me to think that, you know, with my schedule, and I'm, I think that I am Eric's deputy in this by time spent, but not necessarily best suited for it. And so I would entertain the idea of other people who are live closer to town, who are uh, here more often, maybe taking on the second in, second in command from what, what I am doing now, or, you know, where I was not doing, you know, yes, I called in, but, you know, the eyes and ears on the street and stuff like that, I wasn't there. Mike? I spoke already. Do you want me to take the job? No, I mean, that can do the job. <laughs> <laughs> if he wants it. Okay. Um, Kim? Just a couple other resources that I know of, for, especially for when it comes to kids, the Moyle Family Center mm -hmm. That's right. is a good one to top on. They've got um, a lot of people who have, you know, feelers out into the community, kind of might know families that might take in and also have a place that toddlers can play for sure where they have visitation and stuff like that within their facility there, and also the United Way, which you guys probably thought of too. Um, the other question I have was um, for resources are, you know, there's other emergency um, response trained people within our community that are, you know, just by saying, hey, would you will be willing to be a volunteer and give a call out? And I know there's one of them sitting there. <laughs> That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. For something like traffic control, it's often something that is just really tough to manage with the manpower that we have. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other, our highway department also deserves a lot of credit for the long hours they put in. And they got the roads back to passable condition. Yes, they did. Awfully fast, and they did a great job. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank the office staff. My God, seeing Susan and Jan and Rosemary in action was. Yeah, really phones incredible call. because call after call after call and they handled it. Right? Yeah, and um, also Jasmine and the library crew yeah, for just really yeah. just jumping right in and doing amazing work. Actually, um, I spoke to Jean and they, she was going to go to the trustees, the library trustees, about uh, possibly looking into floodgates for the library, and yeah. I think that's a wise We're investment. To do that. Um, this one came a bit too late, and we usually did the sandbag thing. Yeah. But if we had floodgates on the inside of the door, we would have been, we would have had a dry basement. Oh, okay. It was just, and the, the bars that we had someone build really proved to be effective. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. we still had just under an inch all day and kind of had to keep on top of it because yeah. of all the, all yeah. the sandbag basement. Yeah. Yeah. 
And also a big thanks to Greg for coming down and opening Jenna's house. That um, was really above and beyond and um, also offered it as a, pl as a place for people to stay mm -hmm. if needed. So that might also be, you know, when it's more complete, also another option that could be more comfortable uh, for families. Yeah, so that was wonderful. Yeah, for me, my biggest thing, is, I think one of my strong suits, and it was so interesting to see people sort of go to where their strong suits were, um, is the communication piece. So I'm always thinking about how we can improve getting word out to, to the people about what's going on and what we're doing and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, always improving that piece because it's, it's hard, it takes time, yeah. and you want to say the right words and not <laughs> alarm people, but not also not. <laughs> yeah, work close with Brian, if we have another. Yeah, like for example, only a couple of us had passwords to certain yeah. communication channels, so I think we should maybe really smooth that out and kind of come up with a real protocol as to how we're gonna do that, um, rather than yeah. just personal Facebook pages, and, you know. In, it, in addition to that. Yeah, we, so. that the, we learned a lot of that exercise. That, yes. Uh, the yeah. timing couldn't have been better. Yeah, yeah pretty close. Um, <laughs> you know, that exercise really taught us about the limitations of, we think we have some redundancy, but it's the same couple people are redundant for a lot of the same thing. So if it's Eric and myself that aren't available, then suddenly that cuts off access to a lot of different avenues. Right. You know, if, if neither of us are present. Um. Mm -hmm. So, it, did you have any observations or thoughts uh, about the this incident? Again, I, I want to echo a lot of the same statements that we've heard that uh, the village crew did a terrific job, and so did our our town highway department. They worked very diligently, uh, extremely long hours on Friday and then coming back Saturday, uh, reopening uh, virtually all of our roads very quickly uh, and making them passable. Um, the highway department helped us out with a wellness check and others of making sure people who ended up isolated that we could uh, do those wellness checks because we didn't have any equipment that could pass except for the highway equipment. Uh, they did a great job for us, uh, and the community really rallied together. Uh, Sunday at the 5K was dedicated okay. to the families, and that turned out to be a big success, too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, raised quite a bit of money. Uh, I don't have a dollar figure in front of me, but... It was over $800. Eight, $875. Yeah. I think 60 Six, Six people ran or walked and participated. Really? Yeah, it was it was great. Yeah, Lisa Cruz did an amazing job putting that together. And and Jasmine, Jasmine. And, uh, yes, and Jasmine as well. That was awesome. I want to say that I think that the we need to continue our push on crowning the roads and that you know we're focusing on the on repairing the damage. I think what we're looking at should also look at the damage that didn't happen because our road crew has been trying to improve and improving our roads. And so we need to continue. These, these in all likelihood, events are going to continue and more often and, and with more violence. And we need to harden our roads in some fashion. You know? We need to make them better. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Some of the other surrounding communities took a pounding on their roads. You know, Not to say that our roads were held up better because we had done a better job. I'm sure some of them do good work too, but uh, maybe some of it was due to how we maintain it. Yeah, we had some, uh, we had a lot of, I would say that the maintenance and the regular work that our, our crew does contributed quite a bit to our success. Uh, that, you know, having good culverts, having uh, culverts that we can access and clean even during an emergency like this. Uh, that don't, you know, that weren't buried, that were accessible. Um, you know, the ditches that we had, the stone line ditches and things held up very well. Uh, we had some scouring, but, you know, it, it, we're managing a lot of this. Uh, 
our neighboring communities, a lot of them had extensive damage, uh, and some of it to some very recent work, uh, which is, I'm sure, more more a, a turn of fortune than it is uh, a lack of effort on their part. But it's we we benefited a lot from our our work. We ran out of signs too, right? Yeah, we need to get more signs. Yeah. A lot more detour signs and everything. I mean, Real close. You were talking about that earlier, uh, especially right out here. Uh, it, it should have been a detour uh, right by Gold Hill instead of allowing all the traffic to get down there and tractor trailers and all that other stuff. They had to turn around in people's dooryards to get back. Yeah. You know, I mean, you and I were down there and we were talking about closing the road. And I, said that I would go out and block my car across the road. And uh, you said, well, who's gonna go on the other side? And I said, you are, <laughs> as you recall. But, you know, like you said, it's not our job that's supposed to be, the state's supposed to do that. But the thing is, you have to do something because some of these little dinky cars, they're just gonna go right through there and the next thing you know, they're gonna get stuck and then somebody's gonna have to go rescue them. So we just need to, have a plan like you talked about having constables or whatever and close the stinking road down and uh, put some signs up and just take ownership of it uh, just for the good of everything and uh, you know so be it if we take ownership of it well somebody I mean, has to do something I mean taking ownership what I mean by that is now our resources are committed and we can't do it right things. but if we have more people, the constables and stuff right. that are that are going to do this, and the resources aren't going to be taken up. I mean, we could have done that, but then it's kind of a state liability issue, correct? Well, I mean, under emergency situations like that, we have declared a state of emergency. We could have shut the road down. Okay. Legally, uh, what is wise is to have people who are trained in traffic management to be out here. You know, go through the training to uh, well, like flaggers and stuff like that. I've done that in the past, and so it's no no big deal. And I gave all kinds of directions on for people and how to get around and everything else. But somebody should have been doing that right along. And if we'd had the signage, we could have just had the signs up there with the arrows and pointed around for people to get out of here. So, and, and unfortunately, I think it was. What really hit us was we lost the resource of the, the fire department because they got toned out and they were fighting a structure fire. Um, usually we have their manpower available for anything we need, from filling sandbags or whatever. They could have done traffic control. That's true. They did over at the other end of Main Street when the flooding first right. started during the night. Um, Lamoille was stretched so thin because everybody else was flooding. So they were up in Volca, they were in Hyde Park, and they were in Johnson. Uh, typically, it's Hyde Park, in, or not Hyde Park, it's typically Volca, North Volca, and Johnson are any flood events, and Hyde Park isn't you know, involved. But with a, just the stars lined up that way. I have a question. Yes, sir. There was uh, some on Front Porch Forum, but it had some damage. You're supposed to call 211. Yes, yes. It's storm related damage. Yeah. I mean, I fixed everything. Yep. I'm not an insurance claim, but it has a lot of. Did that help them? Or I don't want to tie up the lines. It, there's just, there may be an opportunity to get uh, reimbursed from FEMA. You take I pictures, did you? You take pictures of the damage? Oh, I just fixed it. <laughs> you know, there, there may have been people who basement was flooded and lost their furnace. But I mean, does it help the community for me to make the claim? No, it helps you individually. We will. I, I got two more comments on that. Um, we want to get into Scribner too. At yeah. Some point. Um, the library and Gene Engel were terrific mm -hmm. that day also. Uh, Gene was instrumental in us dealing with the loose propane tank in a timely fashion that we 
might not have known about it until it was, you know, in a worse situation. That she informed us that it was in a bad way, and then called back and informed us again when it had actually broken loose. And you know, that really helped us out. That when we were concerned about it, and then when it, it broke loose, that that was a, a huge moment, and that that made a huge difference to that neighborhood of uh, being able to get that and address it quickly. And the fire department did a great job of getting out of the water in dangerous conditions and uh, securing that quickly and safely. Mm -hmm. So the, the with that, I don't know if you guys did you see the tank? It was a yes. thousand pound yes. uh, propane tank. That's literally a bomb. Yeah. I mean, we would have if, we, it, if it wasn't for the floodwaters, you would have had to evacuate that whole area of the village. There was a video of it. Yeah. 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 yeah that, that was a huge disaster averted, and yeah, thanks to Jane for her early warning on that, and thanks to the fire department for dealing with it safely and quickly. That 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 okay. that, that, that was instrumental to uh, yeah. getting out of this with uh, no serious injuries. Um, also, Vermont Emergency Management called today and just assessing roughly what's going on for damages. And uh, they advise that there probably will be a FEMA rep coming to town within the next few days. With reference to the Scribner Bridge Rocky Roads, they wanted us to make sure, now I forgot the uh, I number. believe it was 406. 406. I'm gonna check it. Mitigation, make sure we state this might be eligible for a 406 mitigation because we've got this study done and uh, instead of putting the road back the way it was with material, is make that improvements that the consultants came up with. With the low water crossing. Right. Uh, but apparently this 406 mitigation is a trigger that when we say that to the FEMA people, they will call. Like <laughs> send money? You need to know. Yeah. Yes. Speak bureaucracy. It would be a mitigation money, so you would, it would potentially could be fixed right, <laughs> so it doesn't happen every flood. Yeah. Um, you had anything else? I was going to reiterate and provide a little more detail about what Charlie said about the 211. Um, you know, this is for people in the audience and, and people at home that. Um, if you do have any damage, uh, call the 211 to check for eligibility for reimbursement. That this is uh, one of it's not always easy to, to get personal reimbursement for uh, damages on an, after an event like this. People might have trouble with their insurance. Uh, th this could make a really big difference to a lot of people to call and check in with that. So if you do have damages, give them a call. But they're not collecting damages like to meet qualifications like we did for a disaster declaration. Mm -hmm. If you don't need assistance, there's kind of no reason to call. But if you do need assistance, don't hesitate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... That covers kind of everything about the storm except for, we want to get into Rocky Road. If you want to get into more detail, yeah. Yep. So this is a study that was prepared uh, back in 2013 about alternatives for uh, Rocky Road uh, at Scribner Bridge. Um, oh, thank you. So, um, is everybody familiar with we had this or word? Is it that many years ago? It was it's that many years ago. It was just as I was having the word. Mm -hmm. You probably remember hearing about it. Yeah, I remember. The word was a big, big. He was pushing for this. Yeah. So a little bit of history about the location then. Um, as we can see currently, uh, there's an interesting geography around. 
Scribner Bridge, that when the Gion River rises, uh, the water wants to flow around the bridge, uh, and that will prevent the river from rising too much. Uh, and washing out the bridge, except in possibly in the case of a, a really, really massive flood. But um, for the most part, the water is going to go around the bridge. The which saving the bridge work, but it, it does uh, wash out the road at that location um, and dump a lot of material into the river at you know the cost that it has to our water quality and uh, a great financial cost to the town to do repairs on the road. Uh, to try and mitigate the cost, the town put some research into alternatives rather than building the road back up uh, the way it's been. We haven't received uh, financial support for this in the past, but we're hoping that this is another opportunity for us to pursue and, and attempt to get um, to implement a, a better solution so that we're not just washing gravel into the river uh, whenever we get floods. Mm -hmm. If you go to page eight, this shows all of the uh, alternatives and what the potential cost would be from uh, doing nothing, which basically is what we did with zero cost. Uh, remove the bridge, relocate the home, raise the road, additional culvert, new larger bridge, relocate Hunter Road, armor the road and intersection at existing grade, and armor low water crossing. As you can see, the, the cheapest option was the low water crossing. And it would probably, or, or the intent and hope is that it would solve uh, the issue of Every time we have a high water, it would still allow the water to go around the bridge, save the bridge, but we wouldn't lose all of our material down the river every time. So, Brian, you're saying, sorry, that it's because the bridge is there that the water does what it does? It's not because the bridge is there. It's more a feature of that the, the area in between the bridge and the house Mm -hmm. is lower than the bridge and there is a, a good avenue for the water to get up and mm -hmm. into that area mm -hmm. and then back into the river uh, without having to go into the without having to actually breach the bridge what, uh, it, and it has a pretty extensive capacity and like we can see right now it scours out pretty quickly uh, which gives it more capacity to hold water in that area. No. Isn't it essentially that the throat of the bridge is too narrow and that we have a lower low water crossing, which is our road, and that's low, that's where we are right now. And so we want a lower water crossing that's armored that doesn't wash out, yeah. but you don't have to repair. Okay. Well, I like what's on the top of page four. Removal of the bridge uh, may be worth serious consideration for a number of reasons, including the following. Alternate routes that are readily available to the location served by the bridge. Historic components of the structure have been significantly altered with little regard to historic preservation. The structure is undersized and may contribute to at least local river instability. The bridge exasperates flooding and associated flood damages, which impacts town finances. So, and we all have talked about that bridge, about it's full of powder post beetles. And uh, a lot of it is going to have to be replaced anyway, uh, internal, external. And the only thing really good on that bridge right now the roof. Everything else is going to have to be repaired. I would uh, seriously consider uh, 
The board should seriously consider abandoning the bridge or removing it and placing it in another location. Would an idea like that have to go before the voters, or do we just decide? That? that could be our decision. Okay. I just know when I posted the pictures of us out there, I couldn't believe how many stories people have of that bridge. My grandmother, my great grandmother, my childhood, you know, it, people are very attached to that bridge. True, but it's not really same. a historic bridge. It's not, it's a Franken bridge. It's not a true covered bridge made out of wood. Uh, if you read on from where Mike was just reading, the variation of this alternative would be to leave the bridge for pedestrian use, but largely remove the roadway approaches on both sides to increase flood capacity. Hydraulic benefits would be a little less, as would be the cost. I mean, I, it's something that I think it should be considered given the costs in the river wants to move where the river wants to move, and there's only so much we can do to prevent that. And, um, and we, uh, there have been other towns that have done other things with their bridges, historic bridges, so they've removed them and made them into other mm -hmm. park features or uh, mm -hmm. other cool things with them. I, I totally get it. Probably not going to be a popular option in the community, but. But we have to look at all alternatives to save money for our town. And we just can't continue to spend money year after year, flood after flood on this. And we have more challenges every year for funds that we have less and less of. If you remove a bridge, does that, you know, change the road's classification, or you know, do you need to? No. So you, you just you just dead end the road on each side. Well, Hunter Road becomes totally isolated at that point. But well, you'd have to still maintain a road, right? So you use Hunter Road. Still go right through there. Yeah. Yeah, the road. Well, that's what's getting washed out. Right? Well, that could be all ripped back up in good shape down that corner and uh, opened up uh, near the bridge itself where that big chunk was. You see, and then it would just go right around it all the time. Uh, I don't understand that. It seems like that would, that's what we're trying not to do. That would go, that would favor a low water crossing. We'll keep the bridge. Well, if we took the home, we could move the road. Because I, I think if you, uh, if you tried to maintain the road and put the riprap in, you're not gonna, the water's still, not, the channel's gonna be still fairly narrow. Mm -hmm. But if we pulled the bridge out and, and, took the out. and took the home, yeah. The Rockies old house, we'd have to buy it. They're saying, well, I said relocate the house, but that's 100000 But So Who owns remove, that home? Ooh, sorry. Well, I was just going to say, we remove the bridge for, yeah. it's estimating 100000 for that. Relocate the home or purchase it, 100000 there, and just make Rocky Road into Hunter Road basically on the other side of what currently is the house. For 200,000, we could get out of there. Which is a hell of a lot more than $75,000 for the water, for water crossing. <laughs> <laughs> so, Especially if the female will pay for the 75. Maybe that's... Is that 406? 406. Yeah. 406. But if you remove all the abutments and everything else, it's going to open up the channel there a lot more. You might not have to buy the uh, Rockies house. If you remove that bridge with the abutments and everything, the channel will be deeper. Right. Wider, it'd be actually wider because you wouldn't have to have so much of the road go over toward the bridge. I wonder how much wider it would be. I assume they built it there. There's a lot of leads there. And I 
assume they, they took advantage of the, the crossing there because of the, the narrowing. We didn't see any ledge there yet. That uh, mud, remember somebody thought that was ledge, but that was just well, but higher it was ledge. There was some ledge higher? Yeah. Towards Hunter End. Okay. And I think right there under the bridge is ledge. I think so. I think that there's some right on the edge of the river, too. I could be wrong. But well, I guess we ought to see what FEMA tells us when they come in. But if you got <laughs> down to the ledge after the bridge was gone, you know, then that would be a deeper channel anyway. And you wouldn't have to worry about washing a bunch of ground in the river. But you wouldn't have to dig it down. It would take it down. Right, but you probably want to dig it down. Which, right I think it's already at ledge. The uh, the stream. Uh -huh. I think might, it might be fairly close because it, it has little pools. I, I think you're right. It's got a beautiful trout pool there. <laughs> yeah. generally be in favor of taking, getting rid of the bridge unless we are finding that uh, we, with some sort of uh, thought and study that we need, that, that, that the whole bridge is, you know, going to be, you know, a replacement project by itself you know, and that it can't exist in its current form. Mm You know, if it's going to be in the river in two years, I think that's a, that's a different subject. Which is really at your, it's part of post speed law. Right. Habitat. I think to Kyle's point, we wouldn't have to take that to the voters, but I think it would be wise. I, I know I was early in my select board career when the powerhouse bridge collapsed. And we as a board were having the exact same discussion. We were talking about putting a steel bridge across, putting a cement bridge across, rebuilding the covered bridge, looking just looking at all the options. And word got out that we were doing that and we were not going to put a covered bridge back up. And it became abundantly clear to the select board on where the public was on that position. Well, that's a highly well, visible bridge too. I want to be clear on what I just said. Uh, if we were to decide that we wanted to go towards bridge removal, if we were to decide, we would want to break it to the voters. Yeah. But we're far from making that decision. That's a sticky wicket, like seeing girls. It's a bridge. You have covered bridges now. Good luck to you. <laughs> Yeah, and we got a state grant to rebuild it. Of course, it's not considered a real covered bridge. Real covered bridge. The only one we have is the Scribner. It's not a real covered bridge either. But that one's considered one by the, the Historical Bridge Association. But but our powerhouse isn't because it's a new one. They out there. Can't be. It's got steel beams on it. They still consider that one an original covered bridge. But not uh, yeah. Yeah. Emotionally, the people consider the powerhouse bridge to cover people. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, okay. they're not concerned with technical definition. It, it looks like it's a document. Yeah. 20 years later, to most people, it's a covered bridge. It had a very beautiful mural in the pharmacy. Yep. As I recall. Thanks, guys. Yes. Good night. Good night. Good night. I got uh, one thing. Okay. Sit down now. <laughs> Is there any more on this? No. no. Okay. When are we going to vote on it? When you see the money, 406. Yeah. You get the 406 <laughs> yeah. first. Okay, sheriff's budget? Uh, we had some questions about the sheriff's budget, but I wanted, if 
I can go out of order a little bit, uh, talking about letters and things that we've received recently. I sent you an email about it. We have received uh, some interest on, or we have received a letter asking if the town would be interested in uh, joining a class action lawsuit against right. uh, pharmaceutical companies for the opioids. Uh, T.J. Donovan wrote a letter recommending that we strongly consider it, and uh, we, we're already already in it unless we opt out. Yeah, that's the way I read yeah. it. So we don't. If we take no action, no we're action, gonna, we're going to be in it. Yeah. Okay. So we'll just take any action. Did you see that email? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. I wasn't sure if you. I don't know how much trouble it would be to to uh, support it. But I think that would be maybe better than just letting it pass and being into it. You know, that's, I don't know how much time you have either. It's not, you know, what, I think it's a good thing. If we support it, what, what do we do? I, mean, I don't think there's a lot to, for us to action to take right now if we support it other than a, if we support it, I'll take a more active interest in keeping an eye on developments and I'll, I'll devote a little bit more of my time to make sure that we're not just passively. Well, I mean, along we support it then. <laughs> I mean, really, we're, we're in it. If we opt, unless we opt out, we're not going to opt out. But if you think a motion from the board is going to help, I'll make that motion that we support it. I don't. I don't know that we need a motion, but a, a general interest from the board that no. you know you want me to. You want we want to be active participants. You then, guys know, be part of this. Yeah, I think sure. so, yeah. 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 Well, okay. So, um, like I said, it's it's going to be a little bit of time and everything for me to be more active in this. I think it's a good idea, but I want I, I, I wanted to. What run would our role be? So yeah. this this letter says the 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 action that he's asking us to take. It is my recommendation that Vermont cities and towns seriously consider participating in this negotiation class. So it's, it's specifically asking us to participate in this class. Yeah. Could be a board member, could be Brian, could be a community member. But I thought we were unless we opted in. We're part of the lawsuit unless we opt out. Right. But on top of this, they're encouraging us to participate in this negotiation class. Um, and there's not a lot of clarity about what active participation is going to mean, to, I don't think. To but. help us participate in the fruits of any settlement activity arising out of this court action. If you're looking for somebody to try to get the most money for Johnson, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. I, I think what we ought to do is send a letter that we're absolutely delighted that they bring the lawsuit, that we are... Uh, we, we are understand we are part of the of the class and, and that we want to be in it, but can they tell us what involvement in the negotiation class would be or part, what our participation would be and what time would be involved and what the, uh, what the, the I mean, we don't know the outcome, but you know, basically they want to know if we're, you know, are we changing anything or is this a PR part on, on his part? Answers to frequently asked questions related to the negotiation, negotiation class can be held, found at www.opioidsnegotiationclass.info slash home slash fact. There you go. I, think the the I tried to copy and paste that, but it wouldn't work, it's, so I didn't get a chance to go back. But I mean, I'll, I'll go back and check it out. I'm going to yeah. see what it's all about. Uh, I guess we're interested. Yeah. And I, I, I didn't. Like between FEMA and tonight's meeting and everything else, I didn't give this a lot of time today, but uh, I figured we were meeting today, so I would bring it up to the board. If, well, they were I think we it's worth anyway. a decent amount of my well, time. The email but, just came out today. So. Yeah. yeah. But you also figured that we would cover it anyway. Yeah. You know, unless you opted out, we aren't going to opt out. Right. So. Well, I would tell you that I, I expect that if we think that Johnson's going to drive this car in negotiations, we're wrong. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, we're... we're True. Yeah. I mean, just to support Philip, they get a lot of pounds from the state. Yeah. No, oh, yeah. It shows that the whole community is, you know, they give me a chance to be involved. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I'd say read, read his, uh, read the stuff, read the attachment, and, yeah. and see 
you know. And maybe you could come back the next meeting with what I'll, your I'll thoughts are more. And whether we would take any further action. Okay. Yeah, if we can help anyway, let us know. Okay. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Study it. Thank you, Greg. Thanks. All right, guys. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. You can stay right till the end if you want. <laughs> almost over. Oh, <laughs> but don't you don't have to. Don't, don't count on that. <laughs> sheriff, I'm going to talk about sheriff. Oh, yeah. uh, I guess you were the one. That yeah, I, I was the one to mention it because there was somebody uh, from the community that was interested in talking about it and didn't think they would get here in time to ask for it to be on the agenda, but they are no longer here. But uh, I'll take it myself, you know, we've got to do something about it. And uh, somehow we've got to get on top of it because it's going to be over $600,000 this year. It, I mean, we went over this before. If you yeah. add the uh, you can't the mix the two together. I understand that, but everybody does. So they figure it's all part of the sheriff's budget. It's going to be over six hundred thousand dollars, and and people, you know, they're spending a million dollars with paying benefits uh, at the sheriff's department, and and somehow uh, they've got to try to bring in other revenue. And it's like I hear talk quite often it goes about this business about you know 80 warnings and, and 20 tickets and then people speeding and driving and, and uh, people witnessing cars with lights out uh, and a cop is sitting there and, and they don't go after them uh, so people ask me questions like what are we paying for you know so, but we had that meeting before, and we we didn't want to get into that situation of telling them to write tickets. But the people in the community are asking for tickets to be written. Now, you want to address this? Per capita and per grandless population, our sheriff's department is writing pulling over more people and writing more war warnings than snow or more snow. More tickets. Tickets. Right? Yeah. Um, so comparatively, these guys are doing a lot more. These people are doing a lot more with less. Um, what was my other point? Uh, one third to two third. Uh, warning to ticket ratio is pretty consistent with other towns and with other um, police agencies, inclu including Mount State Police. Um, we absolutely have um, a budget challenge this time that we need to, I mean, I, you know, I pretty much told Roger flat out that the, the initial budget that he showed us is not going to fly in Johnson. It's just not going to, we need to get those costs down. We talked about ways to potentially uh, reduce service, which is incredibly difficult, and um, there are uh, costs associated with that too. When you need police in the middle of the night and they're not available, there's a cost to, to personal and public property. Um, that, uh, But um, we are working very, very hard to make sure that that budget is um, in line with inflation or slightly higher maybe but your point's well taken about you know services you know and i tell everybody who talks to me about that you know that, that what are you going to do you know if it's you that sometimes is the one that needs the police there and they don't show up yeah. you know so there is a lot of different variables in this whole thing but it's getting to the point where that people aren't going to be able to pay the taxes. Yes. Yes. Especially if they if they monkey with current use in Montpelier, and uh, sure, you know that's going to be a killer. And you know I I've got plenty. I've known people, young people, that have, that are leaving this week 
to North Carolina and probably never come back, only to visit. And we can't continue to tax ourselves right out of into oblivion. Yeah, I mean, in the couple of meetings we've had this last month with Roger, he's gotten that message loud and clear, and he totally agrees. I mean, he's totally on board with understanding that people can only pay so much. So we're going to keep working on it. coming up with a budget that we can present to the voters responsibly. Okay. And I think your thoughts on, you know, maybe the day is coming to try to bring in other revenue sources. Obviously, that doesn't fix this budget. Well, but it's a long term. I don't know why we can't. I mean, I'm still going to, you know, press Roger to see, well, let's, let's go to Waterville and Belvedere and even this year as, as a community select board somehow representatives and go to those communities and say buy into this because this is now is the time to go to the communities and ask for yeah. them to buy in at least now is when they can work it into their budget for next year voting mm -hmm. on i think initially voting on like elmore does uh, a certain number of hours of patrol only per month um, and that brings in you know twenty thousand dollars or so to the budget and helps to pay our costs. If we can get one or two other towns to help with that, that'll, mm -hmm. that'll go a long way. Yep. But that one cut into our service? It would reduce our service by the number of hours that we yeah. contract out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it does stretch things a little thinner. Mm -hmm. If we go too far out, expanding into too many communities, you've got to hire more staff. Right, that, exactly. You know, so yeah, it's definitely a consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, we might, then we could contract right. so many hours. Well, he's providing the service for contracting. Yeah. But but you said that if uh, if they con they took some of the hours away from us, and we're paying the same thing, we would be getting shortchanged. That's essentially what happens with with uh, Elmore. Is that you know the the three towns are responsible for the costs of the budget, but we end up selling twenty hours a month or something to Elmore and they pay us back into that budget and reduce our costs. But there are no more hours, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's basically we own service. No. But we gain yeah. revenue to offset the tax. Yeah, right. Yeah. But it, it's, we own so many hours of, yeah. by contract, we, we effectively own so many hours of police work. Okay. We can choose by bringing in Elmore or Waterville or, or one of these other communities to sell off some of our hours to another community. So we're getting, it doesn't work one-to-one -one for us. It goes through Roger, it gets distributed through all the other. As long as we get reimbursed for it somehow, that's we just, what I'm concerned about. We do. Yeah, we always get reimbursed for that, for anything. Um, the other thing when we're talking about hours of service coverage, uh, this new budget does include uh, fully staffed sheriff's department mm -hmm. uh, that they have for quite a while been down one uh, approved position, and that is no longer the case. So we, we do have a greater degree of coverage now than we had last year. And I'm pressing Roger for more information on that, because that's not completely apparent in the budget you presented to us. No, it, it's it's hard to, hard to ferret out. Yeah, because yeah. we were also paying overtime costs to get the same amount of coverage as six patrol officers. So, yeah, so we, there was a lot of overtime in there. There was a, an SRO in there. Yeah. There, there was a lot of things that made it uh, yeah. not really an apples to apples comparison when you compare the the salary line last year to the salary line this year. And we're uh, we're going to be delving deeper into what makes up that salary line and as much detail as we can get to. To have a better understanding of it, but it there is definitely another officer on staff now. I get talk about they don't seem to be doing enough for the opiate crisis we had in Johnson, <laughs> and uh, I tell people I say, you know, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. You know, uh, we don't we we hope that they're investigating and that they're getting you know gathering evidence 
or a bust or something, but you hear this talk about certain streets in town that are just pickup places on certain days of the week. Mm -hmm. And it continues to go week after week and nothing seems to get done about it. And, uh, can you share anything about that? Uh, you nailed it. That those investigations, and they are going on, um, take a lot of time and a lot of money. And yeah, they want to gather as much evidence as they can before they... And I told them, well, no. The last I say, the, um, you nailed it. <laughs> it takes a lot of time. Right. And that I believe, um, on my limited information, that they're working their tails off on this whole thing. And they, they are doing a lot of good work. And there's also the, the, the other thing that you don't necessarily hear a lot about. Uh, the, the majority of the detective's time is being take, taken up with um, sexual abuse cases. Um, a lot of times against children, and you kind of every once in a while you hear about a high-profile case, but there are a lot of cases that just don't see the light of day, mm -hmm. don't get splashed in the paper for you know privacy reasons because they include juveniles. Um, but that's incredibly important work and, uh, and time-consuming. And time-consuming. Well, I tell everybody that, that will listen to me. Uh, that there is behind the scenes stuff going on in any police organization that doesn't see the light of day until something happens. I so. you know, I, Roger and I have this conversation fairly regularly. I say, well, you know, you need to be, you know, make a bigger splash with what you're doing. You need to let people know. And he's like, well, this is sensitive stuff. You can't just yeah. splash her out. So. I, I always, you know, I, I get it that but the taxpayers and I under, understand the, you know, we do the comparison to this year's budget and the last year's budget and, for, you know, coming up and two years out. But, you know, I, I look at it from the point of view that we could have the, we could have the state police and be basically essentially fly naked, you know, and this is almost like a casualty insurance. You really want to have these people there because of what can happen to you if you don't. And, you know, sometimes, you know, money matters, but sometimes the kids matter, the sexual assaults matter, the drug thing, the, the Jenna's promise, how you transition out of the Soviet crisis, all matters. And the fact that things are bad doesn't mean you don't need them. Doesn't mean that they're not doing their work, you know. There are other factors in, in play. So I, I don't know how we get a match between what the people can afford to pay and what they need, but mm. that's what we're doing. Well, I have nothing against the sheriff's department. All I'm trying to do is bear the budget down a little bit, just like we all are. Yep. I think one of the things is a perception of people that things aren't getting done. To a certain extent, when you read the, the sheriff's report in the weekly paper, it tends to be um, the, the lesser things. You don't get very much about what Texas is doing because they're not putting it out. So people, I mean, you can read that and you can say, well, this is ridiculous. You know, we're paying all this money for these, you know, the way that hears the voices and yeah. You know, you know, so well, it's unfortunate. I mean, that happens, so, but it's kind of unfortunate. I think. It's I think, I think there's a little bit of an editorial bent there that makes me cringe. And on one hand, it's it's funny and it's actually you know it's fun to kind of share with. Friends, so look at the silly thing that's happening to happen in my small town newspaper. But at the same time, it can really trivialize mm -hmm. like the really serious work. The woman who was calling in the middle of the night to say that somebody stole her pants or whatever is a ridiculous thing, and she's just mentally ill. Yeah. Like that's a really serious thing, or she's got you know maybe a drug problem, or you know who knows. I don't know this person. It's a hypothetical person, but um, the editorial bent of the newspaper, uh, please blot her. It, it doesn't do us any favors sometimes. Yeah, well, it, it respects people's privacy. It, 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 it makes light of it, and it doesn't really get the in-depth human problems that are actually being presented in these, in these difficult situations that are actually being presented to them. Yeah. And I, I think it's worth noting when we're talking about investigations that the what we gain with the Sheriff's Department that we would not have the same experience with um, 
the state police is those investigative services. Mm -hmm. uh, that what we gain is not additional traffic stops. That traffic stops the state police could do perfectly fine job with. What we what we're getting is follow through and investigations and uh, you know a real attention to local needs. Including well, that, I mean, the example of the woman in the middle of the night and the pants are stolen, the state police are not going to come out to a call like that. No. Not even a burglary. Not even an active going on burglary. They, that was on CAX yeah. mm -hmm. a few weeks ago. Yeah, response times have just been like this. Yeah. yeah. State uh, police didn't respond when active burglary. It took them hours to get there. Well, in, in reality, this is a statewide problem that the yeah. legislature needs to address, and we are papering it over here, and we're very lucky to have the sheriff's department doing what they do here. That's mm -hmm. right. I yeah. think the majority of, of Johnson feels that way, but they also don't want to feel like they're being taken advantage, you know, like that they're... Yeah. That it, it's still a lot of money. It's, it's a lot of money. And the point, the, there is a breaking... Public the safety grant is, budget that we were presented with is not going to fly. Yeah. Uh, Public safety is what, 27 or 31 percent of our budget or something like that? Around 30 percent. It's close to a third of our budget. Mm -hmm. Well, I tell people to that if we had to try to maintain our own police department, it would be a lot more than that. Yeah. And, and then sometimes with the fire department, we say, listen, you, we're lucky we have these good people that volunteer to do this job because if we had to have a, a man or a fire department, that would cost a tremendous amount of money too. So we're lucky we have good people in the community to step up to the plate. Uh, it would okay. be twice that or more if we had uh, our own department. <laughs> Any more discussion on the sheriff's budget? If not. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what were you saying, Lord? Keep up the <laughs> Any old business? What trying to say, buddy? Really big one. <laughs> Is there some old business somebody want to bring up? Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I don't know if that we can act on this tonight, but um, Roger, uh, Roger, Walter has just has, has stepped oh. back from the. Um, I might ask about that. Trails thing. Our next step was to have Walter consult with our attorney on Act 250 issues. Wondering if we can continue to do that. I'd be willing to stand in in Walter's uh, absence, even though I don't have the lot of information. The does. trustees are taking the lead. That was the. It wasn't our attorney, but the village attorney. Okay. Uh, the village was taking the lead on on that. Okay. Uh, I. I, think I mean, it would be up to the board about asking you to represent us in, in that capacity, but I think that would be a decent way to keep it moving forward. If I went to the trustees with that ask, you would be supportive of it. Yeah, go ahead. Because I think we should still keep moving forward. Walter may come back. Who knows? Well, I think we do have a core of motivated people who would like to do. I don't think they want to do the bureaucratic side of it and get talk to lawyers on 250 and environmental crap, but um, they would really help us out if we could lays a trail for them to build a trail. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <In the minutes. laughs> Any other old business? I might help you with that. Good. No. I could use your help. Uh, you say you shot some ducks? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I thought I had something else, but I guess not. Uh, stand adjourned. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I knew what you said.